Cool. Great. Hello, everyone. We're incredibly honored to be joined by Dr. Cornel West, one of the most remarkable and outspoken philosophers, activists, public intellectuals, and thinkers of our generation. And in all honesty, Brother West, your works on racial justice and a role played by race, gender, and class in American society render you perhaps one of the most fitting voices that we're honored to have today at the Oxford Political Review. I'm Brian Wong, the editor in chief of the Review. Thank you so much for joining us, Brother West. Well, thank you, Brother Brian, and I want to uh, first say what a force for good you are. I must say, Rhodes Scholar, Oxford trained, philosophically engaged. I am blessed to be in your presence and in conversation with you. Well, the blessings mutual, I'd like to think. Um, and on that note, actually, I just want to start with, I guess, a relatively grave and pressing issue that we see today from instances of police brutality and racialized violence in America today. So I'm thinking of problems ranging from the persecution of African-Americans under racist law enforcement, Breonna Martin, Travion Martin, and the coercive separation of families at the Mexican border. And finally, perhaps not to the same degree, but still quite worryingly, the surging anti-Chinese sentiment and rhetoric that I've seen firsthand in the West and in the USA. Do you think we're past the point of no return when it comes to you know, the white supremacist structure bearing its teeth? Or is there a way out here, uh, brother? Well, I appreciate the question, but one never knows whether you're at a point of no return. You're always, we're always looking for a way out. I think that we have to have a, a will to think critically. You have to have a will to uh, compassionately engage with yeah. one's fellow neighbor and a will to sustain some kind of highly mature, often grim version of hope. Uh, but it's clear that we have to historically situate and locate the American empire to keep track of its forms of spiritual decay and moral decrepitude of the forms of greed, especially the corporate greed and Wall Street greed and Silicon Valley greed, but greed that cuts across the, 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 the empire. And that includes class as well as, 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 as race and gender and sexual orientation. Uh, so that what you talked about are these very ugly, monstrous forms of white supremacist abuse of power, be it in rhetoric with the Chinese, be it directly on black bodies or brown bodies, but it's also at work with poor working class uh, people in the American empire, certainly true on reservations, it's certainly true on the barrios and so on. So I think the important thing is to have a very historically informed vision and analysis of what it is to look at an empire undergoing such massive decline and decay it was just a few decades ago that people were declaring the American century. It was just a few decades ago, going back to the, uh, the 1940s and 50s, where the That's end right. of the age of Europe, Europe depended on the Soviet empire on the one half, American empire on the other half, and the collapse of the Soviet empire, the triumph seemingly of the American empire, and now this kind of boom town decline and decay that's taking place, but with all of the military might that it still has, with all of its uh, 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 kind of Thrasymachus-like yeah. power, which is very different than authority in the Weberian sense. But I think that's the beginning of an analysis of those particular symptoms of decay and decline that you're talking about. That's fair. And I'm with you here on the, the prospects of American decline. I, I guess to play devil's advocate, though, I would say that many, many have posited that America has robust democratic institutions and norms. And even if the federal government's terrible and atrocious, you've still got devolved powers in the hands of states. And even if the states aren't handling well, you've got local governance and municipal devolution there where folks on the ground, those who are carrying out you know, administration and bureaucrats, They've got things under relative control because they must answer to the people. And that is a virtue or feature of the democratic system that you don't necessarily see when it comes to sort of other structures and other political systems out there. Uh, do you no, think that's a fair defense? No, I, I think I think that's a, uh, a wonderful response. And I think there's some elements of truth in what you say. There's no doubt that the federalism of the modes of governance in the American empire makes it very difficult for, for there to be massive uh, collapse 
uh, uh, across the board. But there's a deeper point here, and that is that no matter what kind of institutional mechanisms of accountability you have, if you don't have civic virtue working, if you don't have the moral character of the citizens, if the levels of spiritual corruption have set in in such a way that everybody's for sale, just like everything is for sale, it's almost Lukash's uh, dystopia, the commodification of everything, That's right. the kind of thing that Frederick Jameson has been concerned about for the last 40 years. Uh, and at the same time, you have a certain kind of uh, obsession with uh, uh, gunfighting modes of being in the world. You know, Slotkin's great works on America as a gunfighter yes. nation with the myth of the frontier, more regeneration through violence. We are the civilized, they are the natives. We yes. will in fact take over their land. We will impose ourselves. It would be a manifest destiny orientation. And that takes a number of different forms. There's neoliberal versions of that in terms of yep. Iraq and the, uh, the crimes against humanity, like invasions and occupations of Iraq and so forth. So that even given your crucial point about the federalism, which is, I, I think, worth accenting, I don't want to downplay it, mm. that w when you have a spiritual decay and more decrepitude, that it cuts it so deep that the citizens themselves are no longer able to have the kind of backbone, courage, integrity, honesty, decency, to actually engage in a robust public life, then even those institutions become hollow and shallow. Now, I'm not arguing we're there yet, because when you talk about a decline and decay of any yeah. empire, you know, it takes it takes a while. We can go back to mm. Augustine's the sacking yes. uh, uh, that he talks about in the City of God, or it could be, you know, Arnold Tornby's uh, 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 21 to 22 uh, civilizations that under that come and go. Uh, uh, so that it it takes a while, but all of these issues that you're talking about are very discernible signs and symptoms of that decline and decay. That's very fair. And actually, on the note of decline, because I, I think I'm reminded of Gibbons here and his description of the, the Roman Empire and the, the rise and the fall there, even though Gibbons' historiography is questionable, I think, to some extent. Oh, but the narrative is beautiful and dramatic. It, exactly. Right? Although I might say, we, we might think that, you know, the narratives or the application of meta narratives to explain events of the past and to fit them around the lenses of the present always tends to skew things through an ideological sort of framework that that is biased towards our own but actually on that note about the rise and fall of the american empire what do you make of the graham allison's <laughs> your fellow harvard colleague's argument concerning the, the thucydides trap do you reckon china is going to step in and become the next empire or is that perhaps a misreading of china's incentives it's hard to say i mean we're all guessing as elliot said these are all hints and guesses in the dark at this point, there's no doubt that uh, China at the moment has the economic power. China at the moment is trying to expand uh, up militarily. Mm -hmm. But China's got deep forms of decay and, and decrepitude at work in its own imperial project. And uh, uh, so it, 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 it could be that uh, we're, we're in the face of overwhelming ecological catastrophe uh, with you know, possible nuclear catastrophe, yeah. and then the forms of catastrophe at work in both the Chinese and the and the U.S. empires. Right, that there'll be just a kind of impasse, and almost a kind of void. I mean, it's hard to say, really. It's hard to project that. But I don't see any uh, superseding of the U.S. empire by China, even given its movements in Africa and various other parts of the world, building infrastructure and what have you. Now, I, I think it's going to be so much more complicated than that. Uh, the sad thing is it, it will, it's going to be grim. Maybe we're, maybe we're headed towards grim. an age without empires, really. So we're, we're, the decline of the empire has traditionally been seen as a succession game. So you succeeded as an empire by another. The, the British Empire was followed by the Pax Americana, and then the Dutch and the Brits uh, way back in the sort of the second half of the last millennium. And of course, you've got Athens and Sparta and all of that. But perhaps we are just headed towards a world that is persistently and perennially multipolar, that there's no such thing as the empire that's left. Because at the end of, because at the, end of the day, the internet and also the mobilization of folks, the emancipation of discourses,
and the fact that you and I can be talking over Zoom. I think these are all technologies that render the empire either a concept that's becoming increasingly fluid or basically defunct because you don't see militaristic expansionism as the only manifestation anymore of, of hegemony and imperialism. That's right. No, I think I think that's that's true in one sense. I mean, in another sense, if things reach an impasse in such a way that the empires remain in a certain way in place, then you just have a kind of quasi uh, uh, coexisting set of decaying empires, as opposed to empire expan imperial expansionism and so forth. But there's a contingency here all the way down. And I know that you have a great respect for my very dear brother, Raymond Goyce. Yeah. He was my thesis advisor. I wrote my dissertation on Marx. He was just so marvelous. He and Sheldon Wolin. I can still see him now uh, working there and on his table, having me there for hours, going over <laughs> line after line. That's how, that's how meticulous and that's how committed he, he was. But he's always been preoccupied with these historically contingent circumstances under which philosophical reflection, under which politics takes That's place. That's right. Uh, his love of Thucydides, like Nietzsche, uh, followed from this appreciation of contingency. And I think we have to have a certain intellectual humility uh, uh, when it comes to this kind of contingency. You know, the patterns that we think we can discern from the past no, it's like it's like Nelson Goodman on induction, brother. With group, you you just you don't know which way. That's you, so right. Things are going in the future. You know what I mean. And so it can't be whiggish in our understandings of uh, historical contingency, and you can't just be dystopian either. I mean, there's a, because there's an unpredictability. You have to have a certain kind of commitment to integrity, honesty, decency, compassion, regardless of the catastrophic circumstances that seem to be impinging upon us. We have one life to live, and we've got to live it with at the highest level of what the Greeks would call arate, the highest it does, level of excellence and virtue. I, I was struck in particular about what you said about not being you know, captured by dystopian thinking whilst also avoiding historicism and the optimism, the blind faith optimism that comes along with it. And I guess from my point of view, a worry that I have is there's, well, Fukuyama, for one, even though he's now come to clarify it, once was quite optimistic empirically that we've reached the end of history with liberal democracy being at least a stabilizing form of governance, even if it's not the only form of governance. And that thesis has come under a lot of battering, even though I don't think it's been entirely fair to, to, to uh, Fukuyama, uh, Francis, that is. But concurrently, we must ask, is democracy what we're all trending towards or or is this something else that you think, if at all, we're converging towards? Or is there just mm. no such thing as pan-historical convergence in that sense? Ooh, what a wonderful question. You know, we just had Brother Francis in the class that I teach with the great Roberto Mangi, Mangibriera Unger. We've taught for 20 That's years right. at the Harvard Law School, of course, on American democracy. And uh, you probably know Brother Francis supported Bernie Sanders, my candidate, uh, this time. Uh, and I think in fairness to him, that he was in fact wrong about his talk about the end of history, but he was partly right in, in terms of the last man. And you know, that, was, yeah. that was part of the, both the title and the, and the text itself. And that last man was that Nietzschean last man. It was that T.S. Eliot uh, 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 conception of the hollow men, the empty ones, the shallow ones, the superficial yeah. ones, the thinning out of a culture. Uh, that goes hand in hand with the triumph of neoliberal capitalist civilizations and modes of, right. of production and, 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 and distribution and consumption and so on. So he had a certain you know, uh, uh, element of uh, grimness there, almost quasi cogev in that sense. But back to your question, though, see, I think we can only use to some degree the visions that have been bequeathed to us. See, so I consider myself, you know, a radical Democrat. Mm. There's a whole lot of versions of that. I mean, R. H. Tani's one of my one of my heroes as a radical Democrat, Christian Democratic Socialist. But the ism is not important. It's really the concern about individuality and community and making sure we abolish poverty and workers having control yep. over their workplace and so on. Uh, Sheldon Wolin's notion of fugitive democracy, the ways in which 
You know, this iron cage that Weber talked about, the uh, polar darkness and the iciness, the uh, inability to find some kind of light to see where we can go in light of the wholesale commodification, yep. wholesale rationalization, bureaucratization of the world. Uh, um, so that I still use language like radical democracy, but I don't yep. think it's, it's teleological. It's, we're not talking about closure. We're talking about yeah. something that's open-ended. We're talking about something that is open to the unpredictable and the contingent right. that we were talking about. But for me, in the end, though, brother, it's a certain uh, lens through which one views the world. And you see, as, as, as someone who takes the Christian tradition very, very seriously as a lens through which I view the world, you see, I, I have to raise the question, what, what does it mean when the Palestinian Jew named Jesus makes his way to the temple, which is the largest edifice uh, 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 on the other side of Rome, which has That's right. police on the one hand and as a bank and at the same time uh, uh, has the elites there, all the elites, the neo-colonial ones, as well as the Roman imperial ones who are running things and runs them out. I mean, in the American empire, that's the White House, that's Wall Street, that's Hollywood, that's Supreme Court, that's the, uh, so all of those. Are, that's Harvard. right. That's Harvard, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, the, so, the, so the question then becomes, uh, those are the lens through which I view the world. And that's it right. leads toward arrest, it leads toward conviction, it leads toward crucifixion. And uh, whatever happened on that Saturday or Sunday, we can argue, you know, George Steiner calls it just a long Saturday. And of course, it's a kind of holy Saturday for yeah. somebody like Beckett betwixt and between the death of God on that Saturday. But however you come out, we won't get theological at the moment. If these are the lens through which you view the world, then you're always looking at the world through the vantage point of those friends for known called the wretched of the earth. And, of and I want you to, people, no matter what color a nation. I want to ask you about that because the way I see it based on what you said is you sort of see fundamentally correct me if I'm wrong, the interpretation or the interpretive act is something that can be devoid from or splintered off from the, the totalistic understanding act, right? So I can understand right. the world not as a historicist trend or convergence towards an end goal, but I could always interpret it as something that trends towards. And I actually agree with you because I think interpretation itself is a speech act. It's a political act and gesture. Absolutely. Whereas some others think that no interpretation is more evaluative and descriptive and it's not normative, whereas prescription is. But I, I, I'm agree, I agree with you, brother, on that front. But one thing that struck me as well about what you said is the White House as a bastion <laughs> of, oh, yeah. of imperialism. So that perfectly ties me on to the second, to the, another part of our interview, which is what advice would you give to Joe Biden as he picks and forms his cabinet? And you've seen his picks there. You've got Janet Yellen. You've got his you know, recently appointed Defense Secretary Lloyd, Oist, Lloyd Austin. You've also got uh, his picks when it comes to Secretary of State and National Security. And frankly, it does strike me that Biden's playing a balancing act, you know, not to defend him or anything. I think he's trying to balance between different considerations. And that to me seems admirable. But what do you make of it? And what advice would you give to, to Joe Biden? Well, you know, I would say, uh, Brother Joe, you need to look squarely and unflinchingly at the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. that said it's going to be poverty, militarism, racism and other forms of xenophobia and the materialism in your culture that will suck out the democratic possibilities of your That's empire. Right. So whoever you choose, are they going to come to terms with the Wall Street greed? that's inseparable from the wage stagnation, the weak trade unions, the poverty increasing, the decrepit schools, the indecent housing, not enough access to health care, not enough access to that's quality right. education. That's one. Are you going to come to terms with Pentagon militarism? You could put a black man as head of the Pentagon, but if, if, if the Pentagon still has $750 billion going its way, 53 cents for every dollar yep. in the U.S. budget going its way. If you're still going to be dropping bombs and drones too often on innocent people, it doesn't make any difference what color. You talk about the diversity at the top all you want. Diversity without 
a serious grounding in moral and spiritual integrity without serious grounding and genuine solidarity with poor and working people mm -hmm. around the world is just a neoliberal form of weaponizing identity, you see. It's a certain kind of class politics hidden under race or gender or sexual orientation. Thirdly, I, I, I would point out you have to come to terms with the, uh, 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 with, what, with white supremacy and the ways in which it's been inseparable from the predatory forms of capitalism over time and space, both in the United States especially, yeah. but in other parts of the world uh, as well. And so I think the kind of centrist neoliberal reforms that he seems to be gesturing toward are not yeah. going to be enough. Now, of course, I've talked before about being part of an anti-fascist coalition that pushed the neo-fascist gangster out. I'm talking That's about right. Brother Trump himself. And it looks like he's going to go. We'll have to see. You know, we still got a few weeks. You yep. just don't know. But, uh, but, but, I, but a neoliberal disaster that was in place prior to Trump that helped produce the Trumps, that helped produce the authoritarian populist right. projects, you see, uh, that didn't speak to the issues of inequality, didn't speak to the issues of uh, the deep and profound yeah. contempt that my large numbers of my fellow citizens have for the arrogance and the condescension and the haughtiness of neoliberal elites, not just in Washington, but in education, in mass media and so forth. So a lot of that uh, support of Trump, you know, is not a love of Trump. It, That's it, right. It's, 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 it's very much both material conditions in terms of their uh, a weight stagnation and their decline in, 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 in living condition, but it's also a deep hatred of liberal and neoliberal arrogance of the professional managerial class. And that kind of populism is very dangerous. We tried to, 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 to re, yeah. redirect it with Bernie Sanders, of course, uh, uh, and we, we were crushed by the neoliberal uh, mm. establishment in the Democratic Party in that way. Uh, but I think we have to have a, as uh, as subtle an analysis as possible. It can't be Manichaean. It can't right. be all the good on one side, all the bad on the other. Take your melodrama somewhere else. We we deal with life and death issues here. And I think the Manichaean mentality um, is also problematic uh, and then transpires on a different level. And here's where I want to sort of defend identity politics, actually, because I think at the moment a lot of the critiques of identity politics tend to argue that, or in my opinion, conflates two strands of critiques. One is valid, one is less valid. The first is the view that the liberal establishment often employ tokenistic identity politics as a form of perpetrating and maintaining the status quo, of basically deflecting itself against criticisms by performing feel-good activism and tokenistic concessions. Whereas the second form of the critique, and this is something that, because I was reading Fraser and Honneth, uh, quite recently oh, oh, as yes, well. Yes, yes, and I, yes. I love Fraser. Sister Nancy. You know? Sister Nancy yeah, yes. yeah. So Nan Nancy, and, and she yeah, argues yes, quite yes. potently you know, that recognition and redistribution can't be collapsed into one another and that you've got to recognize, to, to some extent, recognition politics as separate from class politics. So my defense of identity politics isn't necessarily how it's manifested, you know. Uh, brother, I agree with you right, that there have been trivializations of those organizations. Right but we've got to... I'm going to keep the recognition game going, though. No? I want to put this up for people. Feminism yes. Capitalism Critique. These are essays in yes. honor of Sister Nancy. That's right. Yeah, people need to know about her work there. Uh, but no, I, I, I agree with you. But, but see, but part of this has to do with the fact that, I mean, we have to make, we have to bring power and pressure to bear to get concessions to any mm. status quo because people only have one life to live, and uh, at least in space and time in this way, and all of us have this death sentence in these yeah. particular uh, spaces and times in which we find ourselves, That's that we're right. thrown into in the Heideggerian sense. And, the, uh, uh, and so, yes, it's more than token in the sense that it can push certain resources and discourses in a certain direction, but as long as, all it does is stay within the neoliberal horizon. Mm. No matter how much pushing you do, you still have <laughs> excluded certain options and alternatives which must be in place to call That's into right. question the basic assumptions of your status quo. Uh, 
And this is, you know, this is the weakness and the feebleness of the American left. It's not just political, but it's, mm -hmm. it's intellectual. It's, it's, it's not enough vision. It's not enough analysis. And it's not enough organization. Over 70 million voters cast their votes for Donald J. Trump in this election. It, it's astounding um, that, that that's the case, despite everything that's happened. But do you think the best way to win back the hearts and minds of these folks is through invoking precisely a progressive in class issues and also a you know, redistributionist politic? And is that the best way for the Democratic Party to, to make amends and heal the divides? No, no, I think we've got to cut deeper than that, though, my brother. Yeah, that's right. We've got to cut deeper than that. I think we need a, a profound moral and spiritual regeneration, a discourse that speaks to the pain, the anguish, the isolation, the alienation, the hurt, and then recognizes why they reacted to a neoliberal yeah. order by moving in a right-wing direction and try to convince them that lo and behold there is a better way to go yeah. a higher moral and spiritual ground to go and this is not just a matter of pitho or just persuasion it's a matter of getting them to see the world through different kinds of lens given where they are you have to you have to have enough patience to get inside of the skin of That's one right. fellow citizens in order to see where what we used to call imminent critique, where, where the, the, there's enough there that allows them to see not just the contradictions, but other possibilities. You see. And uh, part of the problem of redistribution politics and part of the problem of uh, the traditional leftist discourse yeah. is uh, it doesn't allow people to, to, to see differently. You know that wonderful line that Henry James writes to which Robert Louis Stevenson, I think it was January 1901, which says any, any theory that cheats us from yeah. seeing is not kind to us. That's right. And seeing, theory itself, you have to be able to see things that they don't see at the minute, at, 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 at the moment, I should say, at, at the moment, you see. And it, it is not a matter of uh, just discourse. It's a matter of examples. So that you take, for example, the, these, the 75 million that you talked about. You got 58% white brothers voted for Trump in the country. 53% yeah. of white sisters voted for Trump. 35% of Latinos voted for Trump. 28% of queers, 30% of Jews. Yeah. You see, th those are major groups. 18% of black That's mothers right. voted for Trump. You say, <laughs> wait, 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 what's going on? Well, this is part of the decay and disintegration of a culture in which they're, they're so frustrated, they're hurting, that they're even willing to go with a candidate who has a significant right. slice of xenophobic, racist, Deep, deeply reactionary and right wing sensibilities, but you got a whole nother group of folk yeah. who are so frustrated and upset with neoliberal elites, they can't stand them. And so they say, we well, only got a choice of two. And of course, you know, 40 some percent of my fellow citizens don't vote at all, That's right. which is a whole nother issue. Now, brother, I think you're absolutely spot on that we've got to reach across the divide and see them and see individuals not as subjects or objects of analysis or paralysis, but as agents that you can converse with and intellectuate with. Or this human is beings I, with lived experiences, it, with structures and, rights and, and values that need to be 81% that, of my right. fellow Christians that's right. voted for a neo-fascist yeah. gangster, well, because of abortion, well, because of same sex, well, because he still That's got right. too much xenophobic sensibility. But, you know, some of those same folk are involved in struggles against poverty. But I've got to worry. Based on their Christian understanding, they know that Jesus That's had a right. prejudice in favor of the poor, tilt toward the poor, and so forth. And yeah. So, so they're, 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 they're a little bit more complicated. I'm not I'm not trying to whitewash them because uh, no. we, we know, you know, we know the examples of just the outright hatred and contempt yeah. that's manifest on the right. Absolutely. But I've got to worry here, though, in that I think there are two conflicting considerations and forces that could be pulled apart. But at the moment, I think in our current version of the account, 
are ne and aren't necessarily reconcilable. So I'll point out the first of them is the need to humanize or I'll characterize as the interlocutionary prerogative. You've got to reach out to them across the divide, listen to them and hear, hear them out there. But on the other hand is what I call the ideological obligations and that you, you have fundamental obligations to stand by what is normatively just. And that is also why you, I presume you're so unflinchingly, you know, unyielding towards the neoliberal establishment who, you know, if you want to talk to them, you want to reach into the pockets and converse with bankers, they would necessarily have a sort of what we call management consultant speak or like the, the big <laughs> four speak where they go like, what's the, what's the SWOT analysis? And what's, what are the chances, expected returns and all that? But these languages and these discourses innately are embodied with and embody, in my opinion, uh, embedded capitalist assumptions, neoliberal capitalist assumptions. So you've got a tension here where you want to reach across, right, by practice. You want to engage the crowd. But in terms of ideological and normative preconditions, this, seem to be, this seems to be a bullet and a moral cost that might just be too pricey. You know, for me to humanize a Trump supporter, or for a Trump supporter from their point of view, to humanize someone who supports the leftist land grabs and the socialism in the eyes of the Democrats or their eyes of the Democratic Party, it just strikes me as these are two, you know, tense forces that we need to find a way to reconcile, or else That's we're true. stuck in and that divide. It, there's a possibility, too, my dear brother, that we're just between a rock and a hard place, and that there might not be a way out. It may be the case, just like the species itself may not have the cultivated capacity to avoid self-destruction. We just don't know. That's the skeleton hanging in our closet. We hope that's not the conclusion. We fight against it. It might be that the American empire, uh, given all of its experimentalism and all of its flexibility on certain issues when it comes to militarism, when it comes to Wall Street domination yeah. of the economy, when it comes to big tech, uh, uh, when it comes to white supremacy, uh, it might be that my fellow citizens don't have the, the required uh, courage and vision and, 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 and capacity to, to, to keep track and to affirm the humanity of the masses of poor people and the masses of black poor people or brown poor people. We just don't know. Each empire and civilization has its, its structural limitations and its spiritual thresholds. And if they can't work it out, then self-destruction follows therefrom. And we just don't know. Now, again, I'm not saying that uh, that ought to be a conclusion, but it, 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 it's very real. And see, I come from a tradition, my dear brother, the black freedom struggle, yes. where we've had uh, speeches going back to the 1837s when Henry Highland Garnett would stand up with one leg and say, black people never confuse your situation with that of the Israelites of the Christian Old Testament. For us, Pharaoh is on both sides of the bloody red seas. Everywhere you look, you got a different Pharaoh. Sometimes the Pharaoh might be black. Sometimes the Pharaoh's white. Sometimes the Pharaoh could be brown. But there really is no way out because the fundamental commitment to empire and predatory capitalism and white supremacy cuts so deep. Now, I don't believe that that ought to be, again, a, yeah. a, a conversation stopper. But for, for Marcus Garvey, it was. And Garvey's part of, part of my tradition. I yes. fight with him. I argue with him for Malcolm X. Yeah. Uh, I, I love Malcolm X. I, I, don't con I can't conceive myself without him. But he felt that America just didn't have that capacity. Could be true. Martin Luther King Jr. ended his life saying what? The country is much sicker than I thought. The great W.B. Du Bois right. ended what? The Negro could never win in America. I got to go to Ghana. I've got to cast my lot on an international yeah. stage. I won't give up. I'm not going to be pessimistic in that cheap sense of being cowardly, but I'll have to fight on the international stage. And of course, he was wrestling with the Soviet empire with all of its yes. repressions and regimentations and so forth, but was still anti anti-colonial in Africa yeah, right. and the American empire that was supporting so much of the vicious forms of colonial rule in Africa. And he situated himself as a Pan-African that he was on the African continent. And I think this harks back as well to an age old struggle or age old schism within, you know, the civil rights movement. And I, I guess one figure I want to turn the spotlight to for a second is Booker Washington, who's obviously very controversial, you know, Booker, has been critiqued for selling out, for being a shrill, for being an apologist. And yet, on the other hand, he, he did also seem to have accomplished a lot for the movement and especially for the brothers and sisters 
who were living under a largely white supremacist state. You'd call it covert operations. You'd call them capitulatory realism or self-defeating pessimism. But what do you make of Booker Washington? Well, I mean, I, I, I try to imagine myself, you know, under conditions of such vicious American terrorism, black folk getting lynched every two and a half days, yeah. year after year after year, uh, no real possibilities of any kind of fundamental That's change. Right. And he, he decides to go with the, uh, the robber barons. I mean, Andrew Carnegie gives him almost a million dollars and says, spend over 800 for the institution. You can spend the, the rest of it in any way you like. Booker was not a corrupt man. He, he did live decently, but he didn't live extravagantly. He's very different than the black bourgeoisie uh, these days that would buy four or five or six houses, Martha's yeah. Vineyard, and all this kind of mess. See, Booker wasn't, wasn't like that. But uh, he, he cast his lot with the robber barons. He cast his mm -hmm. lot with the, uh, the elites of capital and the captains of capital. And yeah. he, he had tremendous cash flowing in his direction, not just the Tuskegee you know, uh, Institute, but the newspapers all around the country, networks, job placement networks that he, that he was ahead of. Uh, and see, I, I, I would have been very, very critical of him but I, I still would have worked with him when it comes to educating black folk in the Jim Crow South. I would have lectured. I wouldn't have talked at Tuskegee. He was too dictatorial as a president. <laughs> but, but I would have lectured. I would have spent time with those precious students. I would have spent time with George Washington Carver, one of the great That's scientists right. of, of the latter part, of the middle part of the 20th century, uh, uh, or early part of the 20th century, I should say. Uh, uh, and, and, and so, you know, you had to be jazz-like, though, man. You got to be in improvisation. I would have spent some time with Garvey in terms of uh, trying to speak to his people in terms of their Black nationalism, but I'm suspicious of all forms of nationalism. I mean, as a, as a revolutionary Christian, all of these flags can easily become yeah. idols, but I know flags are all, can also play an important role in terms of pulling out the best of people at times, but it tends often to, to pull out the worst become chauvinistic and what have you. So you have to have this kind of intellectual humility, intellectual patience, right. but still hold on to your integrity. Most importantly, hold on to your calling, your vocation. And that has to do with putting your heart, mind, and soul into your work and trying to ensure That's that right. it becomes as much a force for good as possible given the catastrophic and grim times that we, we almost always find ourselves in, in space and time. Now, that's very fair, um, brother. And you're an outspoken critic of Obama's tenure as well. Uh, now, I'm not a neoliberal apologist, on the contrary to some of the YouTube comments we're getting. But I would <laughs> just note that I think Obama's hands were tied by the fact that he arguably was in a position where, given everything that happened in 2008, you know, he needed to work with and talk across the aisle and engage the Wall Street establishment in order to even stand a chance without getting rebuked and blocked by, as he was eventually, the very obstinate Republican Party in the, you know, in the congressional setting. So I guess my worry there and my, my defense of him is in an America where money still speaks louder than justice, where Wall oh, yeah. Street wields more influence than tens of states combined in picking and choosing our next leader, Obama had a tough game of balancing, and I guess you could say he misbalanced his books, but I wouldn't go so far as to be critical of him necessarily, given that I think there were also difficulties that he and his establishment faced, and he needed to make con concessions and compromises in order to get anything through. Well, again, no, brother, I mean, if, if your calling is to tell the truth, the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak, mm. and if your calling is rooted in a fundamental solidarity with suffering peoples yep. who are exploited, who That's are right. degraded. I'm talking about poor and working people here and around the world. You cannot but have a critique of someone mm. who's head of an empire, uh, no matter what color they are. And they're all not the same. You know, yep. neoliberals different than neo-fascists and so forth and so on. Uh, if my dear brother Bernie Sanders had won and I worked hard for him, just like I worked hard for Obama, but I worked hard for him. I would still have to be a Socratic critic of yeah. Bernie Sanders. So yes. in that sense, I do believe in criticizing him, but it's the same critique based on the same insight. I want to know what kind of relation to Wall Street will you have? If you bail out Wall Street and not 
not homeowners in Main Street, yeah. yes. if you give them trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars yeah. at the very moment in which the children child poverty is escalating at the same time the mass not incarceration right. is intensifying, at the same time you're dropping drones in Yemen and Afghanistan and Pakistan yeah. and Somalia on folks, some of them innocent folk, you got to kill a list every Tuesday. You expanding the surveillance, sur surveillance state and the national mm. security state, and you're messing with my dear sister, sister Ch uh, 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 Ch uh, Chelsea, and, and and my dear brother Julian Assange, and others. Yeah. That's all Obama. Those are choices he made. See, when he met That's right. with uh, the thirteen heads of the firms coming out of Wall Street in March of two thousand and nine, you see it in the Confidence Man by Ron Sussman. And what did he say? He said, I stand between you and the pitchforks. I want you to know I will protect you. I want you to know that I stand with you. And that's why not one Wall Street gangster went to jail. Given all of the crimes, inside of trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activity, predatory, predatory lending, all these are crimes. Not one Wall Street executive goes to jail at the same time, poor and working people with drugs and a whole host of nonviolent offenses going to jail like I don't know what. How could I not bring serious critique to bear relative to my calling. My calling doesn't mean that I'm free to say anything, but this is Parisia, right? This is a certain kind of fearless speech, unintimidated speech, plain and frank speech that uh, goes back to Socrates, right? Socrates says Parisia is the cause of my unpopularity. That's line 24a, Plato's Apology. He's free to speak. He's free to criticize. And he's willing to pay a price. So I got to pay the price. What is the price? Well, Obama's people say, Brother West, you're a traitor. Brother West, you're un-American. Brother West, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. I say, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not speaking it out of any gain of popularity. I don't give a god dang about no popularity. I want to die with some integrity and solidarity with folk who are suffering. That, that's what my calling is. Uh, uh, and it, it, it doesn't elevate me. You know, I'm not self-proclaimed. This is what I choose. I mean, you understand what I'm talking about with those two great essays of Max Weber. I do. 1917 yes. and 1919 on the roof, on vocation. That's what we're talking about. The two kinds of ethics, right? The two kinds yeah. of conviction. Of That's right. Responsibility. And, responsibility. and then that moment where he brings them together when your whole soul is being laid bare. That kenosis, that emptying of a soul in the form of writing and bearing witness and so forth. And see, for me, as you know, you see, I'm basically a jazz man in the life of the mind anyway. And the blues man in the world of ideas and the jazz man and the blues woman have to empty themselves to allow the tradition to come through them in such a way that their voices and their right. visions can constitute a way of empowering others as they find themselves in catastrophe. And the blues is a personal narrative of catastrophe lyrically expressed. And therefore, we always already are in various kinds of catastrophes, looking for ways out of those catastrophes. Reminds me a little bit of change in the, the subject of, of Raymond Goyce, right? That's right. We're looking for a way out. But, but I think the... Call it into question the rules of the game, be it the chess right. and the seventh seal that he starts that text off so magnificently. But we won't go into Raymond Goyce at the moment. But, it does but strike Connection with catastrophe. It, it does strike me, brother, that in terms of the way out, because interestingly in our discourses, we often say the way out as if it's a singular, as if it's, you know, the only way out is X, Y, and Z. Always more than one, brother. But that's right. But I, I was just thinking, you know, on the question of reparations. Now, I, I, I've personally, because I study and I work predominantly within the field of post-colonial justice, I, I believe in reparations, but I believe more systemically that reparations should not take the form of just handing out cash that's not the right way of going about reparations. It's instead right. about reconciliation, dialogue, and ultimately rebuilding in a way that does justice to the victims and descendants of the past. That's but right. I, I'm just curious to hear, what are your thoughts on the case for black reparations? Because I don't necessarily think Tyna Hasey Coates makes the most convincing case for it, but I think, you know, uh, folks like well, Bernard... This, this is the strongest case right here. You see this text? That's from right. The, from here to equality. This is, this is Brother Darity and Sister Mullen. Uh, he's a sophisticated economist trained at MIT. He's been teaching at Duke for many years. And he holds up, he, he lays bare the three pillars. It's both slavery as well as Jim Crow and ongoing discrimination. And he talks about it in terms of the public legislative process. It has to be a decision made by the people 
in our elected officials in that sense. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. It's not just about money, but it includes that. And you got Sister Yvette Cornell. You got Brother Antonio Moore of the uh, ADOS movement concerned about making reparations. But I'm glad to see Brother Coach laying that out, you know, in, in the magazine. We need all the voices we can get. But you got Charles Ogletree's been at it. I've been part of the reparations movement for over 42 years. Yeah. Going all the way back with Randall Robinson, the great Randall Robinson, uh, who now lives in Virgin Islands. Remember his book, The Debt? It came out way back, maybe 35 years ago. Yes. It was a bestseller and so forth. But, it, but but again, reparations has to be cast okay. in terms of what is the truth about the past in relation to where we are and what forms of justice are appropriate mm. so that it's not viewed as some kind of chauvinistic, psychologically sensitive oriented mm. way of dealing with peoples of color mm. who could catch in hell. No. What is the truth about the development of the United States? What is the role of slavery? Why was it that slaves themselves constituted more wealth than all of the railroads and factories and other mm -hmm. industrial units at the beginning of the war? I mean, that's that's levels of profit. It's unprecedented for the United States, you see. That's right. Although I would say that the truth orientation, so here's where I'm going to play another another devil's advocate. Oh, that's good, that's good. I agree with you that truth is important, but I'm wary of three issues or concerns I have. The first is just what we con what constitutes truth or what we intersubjectively imagine to be truth is by definition always the product of power structures. We can resist power structures, reinvent the wheel, create or institutionalize a new truth, but that is still a byproduct still of hegemonic forces because those who are subaltern, those who are not part of the hegemony, never have the ability to cite the truth that is taught in textbooks. Maybe with the advent of social media that's changing, I don't know. But secondly, the process of truth discovery and uncovering exactly who's wrong, who's right, who did X and Y and Z. Um, Irish Marion Young and, and folks in the structural justice tradition reckon that that's too divisive. You know, that's innately something that forces us to reckon with liability, which translates to both blame and antagonism. The issues with Young's argument, but I'm just throwing this into the discussion mm. for us to think about. And the final worry I have, um, Doctor, is I, I think yes, even yes. if there's no truth that you can identify on a granular level about who did wrong or who wronged X, Y, and Z, wronged Alpha, Beta, and Gamma, at the end of the day, it's the group identities and the power dynamics on a most macroscopic level that matter. So individual truth, perhaps, in the face of or, or given the fact that you don't really need truth to pass that responsibilities, maybe a secondary ingredient in a search for reparative justice. What do you make of these thoughts? And do you think these are fair criticisms? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there, my brother. I mean, there are, uh, I mean, there's certain crude Nietzschean versions of that, which yeah. is to say there just is no truth. It's just a matter of who's in power. Yeah. So we know Nietzsche never, never believed that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and even Foucault never really believed that. Foucault was right. He knew that any truth regime was going to be constituted with certain kinds of power That's operations right. going on. But that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, this is not a uh, an iPad and the iPad is independent of me and so forth. It's just I can only understand it through the lens through which I view it in light of the cultural yeah. baggage that I have and the antecedent social practices that shape how I look at it. So that the historical context is one thing. It's always already inescapable and unavoidable, but it's not so determining that somehow truth itself drops right. out. And the same is true about the suffering. I mean, the suffering of working people, the suffering of women, the suffering of trans, the suffering of, uh, of demonstrators in Hong Kong, you know, Brother Joshua and the other, you know what I mean? Th those are real. And, and, and we have to have some understanding or to try to come up with some account. And it can't just be a descriptive narrative. It's got to be explanatory in intent, but it has to be fallible, which means the truth is always going to be in the end bigger than all of us. So we can still make certain kind of claims about, you know, mm. the slavery and the development of the American economy and so yeah. forth. But it's always fallibilistic. I, I believe in skepticism, but it's always retail, not wholesale. As John Dewey put it, you that, never call everything in awesome. question. But retail skepticism is inescapable. What Stanley Cavell called the truth of skepticism, which does not mean skepticism is true, but there's a truth in it because it generates a critical energy that we all need. 
That's right. And, and on, on critical energy, on the charge of critical energy, now increasingly we've seen backlash towards sort of the progressives or maybe just the liberal and even neoliberal movement for participating in a censorious, allegedly, censorious cancel culture, one that seeks to silence, alienate and basically crush dissent. That, that's what the critics are saying. Um, I just want to know, brother, what do you make of this criticism? Do you think there's a problem with cancel culture or do you think it's just an overhyped sort of moral panic coming from the right and, I guess, certain segments in the left? Well, I mean, based on my own attempt to bear witness over against any form of cancellation or any form of silencing folk, I come from a tradition of Black people who are, whose anthem is lift every voice. Not every echo, so we're not just talking about yeah. instances of an echo chamber, but lift every voice. And uh, that means that people do have a right to be wrong. I have a strong libertarian sensibility here. I spent, as mm. you know, some good time with my dear brother, Robbie George, who is yes, a right. leading conservative uh, brother. And uh, we, we're very concerned about ensuring that people mm. are able to raise their voices, uh, whether others think they're right or wrong, as long as they don't engage in injurious harm. But we have to have a robust public sphere where people are not fearful of raising their voices. And this is ironic in some ways because you know, traditionally it's been those of us on the left who have been silenced, those of us on yeah. the left who underwent repression. That's what the Espionage Act was, was all about. I mean, that's the act that Obama used more than all the presidents combined. Yeah. Right? But that was primarily at Eugene Debs. That was primarily at Paul Sweezy. That was primarily at Paul Robeson. That was primarily at W.B. Du Bois. Claudia Jones deported and so forth. So that uh, I think we have to have a fundamental commitment to rights and liberties as a precondition for any civilized order. And that's in Asia, that's in Latin America, that's, that's right. in Europe, that's in the United States. That's, that's everywhere across the board for me. Folks have the right to be wrong, but I would also push back and say folks have the right to be, to some extent, I think, immunized or protected from damaging speech. And I guess the standard moves that go on here is, yes, there's hate speech regulation. No, hate speech regulation is arbitrary. Yes, hate speech regulation strikes the right balance. But fundamentally, I think certain segments of the left, and, and I do have sympathies for the thoughts as well, would argue that hate speech, especially the ones that are the hate speech laws, the ones that are stipulated and passed under the hegemonic structures we see today, are always going to be incredibly, incredibly limited and minimalist concerning what constitutes dangerous speech. So whilst it is, of course, the case to err on the side of caution in terms of restricting one's liberty to speak, I, I, I would posit that there's also a symmetric need to be cautious about the right uh, to, to be free from psychological harm and infringements. And we should weigh these two rights on a more, I guess, direct and apples to apples basis as opposed to just focusing on one right or the other. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true, but we have to be very clear about the, the pluralistic and conflictual That's right. character of uh, the ways in which these various goods are bouncing up against one, and one another. Let me give you an example that, uh, you know, we here in the United States and the American empire, we've got over 20 states that view any one of us who support the BDS movement, the boycotting of, uh, of the vicious Israeli occupation and the products that come out and so forth, that we're all anti-Semites. Whereas so many of us, I would say even the vast majority of folk in the movement, no one movement is pure, of course, and we got to fight anti-Jewish hatred and prejudice no matter what, where we see it. But if you're in a situation where the last nonviolent option is a boycott, very much like South Africa in, in the 1980s that we did, uh, uh, then censorious or cancellation from the government. This is that Congress passed that law, over 20 states passed that law. So when we even try to come together to have a discussion of the Palestinian plight and predicament, and we acknowledge the degree to which yeah. some of us support the boycott, you, 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 you're canceled, you're demonized, you're degraded, and so forth. You say, well, wait, well, wait a minute, though. Let's have a debate about this thing. You see, well, our conception of anti-Semitism includes anybody who supports it. Well, then where'd that come from? It's so broad that we can't even mm -hmm. think critically for ourselves. And then, of course, I asked the question, 
Well, if there were a Palestinian occupation of precious Jewish brothers and sisters, would you all have exactly the same argument? I don't think so. So then you say, oh, so, so this is not a question of integrity and moral consistency and ethical constancy. This is power. And that's another reason why we had, we had to have the triumph of Socrates over to Simicus, given all the limitations that Socrates has in his own way, because it can't just be power. There's got to be some moral and spiritual dimensions that are not reducible to mm. the use of political power, congressional power, group power, mob power, whatever it is, you see. And as we near our, the end of our conversation, sadly, I've got a few more questions. But one thing that really strikes me, uh, brother, is you talked about power. Now, I want to just observe here, I guess, that you know, you've also emphasized consistently in the past that civility and civil dialogue are critical as a precondition for fruitful political action and change and exchange. It's a very, in my opinion, Arendian and noble conception of political action, lying with speech and yes. debate and all of that. Absolutely. But I guess the worry I have is conceptions of civility. So I'm looking at Sally Haslanger's work here and also Iris Marin Young's uh, are often skewed quite heavily by social biases. So a white man speaking ardently is deemed civil and confident, whereas a queer woman of color doing the same might be seen as rude, uncivil and out of place. So I guess if we are to either sort of use civility as a basis for dialogue, it must be reformed and reclaimed or alternatively, might there not be a case for shunning or eschewing civility in favor of just more open, vigorous debate and oh, discussion? No, I, I, I love the way you formulate that. I don't really like the term civility. That's really not a term I would I would use. Yeah. I mean, it's better than people killing each other. But uh, <laughs> uh, but John Boland's book on tolerance right. among the virtues is very important here to get at something deeper than civility. But I believe in in respect. And and, 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 and and the grounds of both respect and even self-respect that, that Rawls and others talked about within the liberal egalitarian tradition that, yeah. that my dear teacher John Rawls was part of. And, and beyond that, though, you see, as someone who uh, comes out of legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., which is a prophetic legacy of Jerusalem, particularly prophetic legacy of the black church, uh, uh, so much of what we say is viewed as uncivil. Yeah, because if you if, if you, you you live in a white supremacist civilization tied to predatory capitalism and imperial expansion around the world, that's right. That uh, you know you say, look, I love these unloved people. Well, black love is a crime in a white supremacist world. You see, so that however you express yourself, I mean, Malcolm X is viewed as the exemplar yeah. of uncivility when he's trying to speak a truth and get exactly. the love out. Of, in relation to a people who were unloved. And then as he continued to grow and develop, he would say, oh, I'm for truth, no matter who's for it. I'm for justice, no matter who's against. I'm for hu humanity first. Well, that was his humanistic move, but he had the same love working in him that was growing and maturing. That's so, that right. I, so I'm a little, so I, I'm with you in that regard. We must have a robust inquiry, dialogue, conversation, encounters, uh, that are intense, but it has to be mediated with a with a respect. At least that's the aspirational goal, the regulative ideal. You know, that, that's very fair. I guess where I d differ from you is I'm just more pessimistic about how respect as a notion is wielded as a criterion to exclude, but also to police. But I'm with you in no, general. But you're right. Debate, you're right. Because right. see, all of these notions are polysemic, and it's subject to multiple uses and interpretations. And that's borders. right. We got to be constrained about these terms. You're absolutely right. But we go. it takes us right back to the issue That's of so the character, certain ethical ways of being in the world. And by ethical, I don't mean moralistic in the yes. sense. I mean, this is the kind of human being I choose to be, and I'm going right. to live and die for this love, this justice. I've noticed that you often say brother and sister referring to folks. Is there anyone, I'm just curious, brother, whom you wouldn't count as a brother or sister? Nobody at all. Nobody Even folks knows. who actively want to sort of, in many ways, preclude you from identifying as brother and sister to, with them. Well, I was in Charlottesville and we were standing there singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And they were trying to crush us. And thank God Antifa came and saved our lives. And I said, these are sick neo-fascist Ku Klux Klan-like brothers and sisters because they still made an image of God. They can change. They're not static. They're not stuck in their hatred. 
they can go another way. There's always a possibility of transformation. That is the Christian promise. It makes no sense whatsoever in the eyes of the world, but through the lens of the cross, brother. You're, you're incredible. always a possibility. Your compassion and optimism really, really are, are incredible. And, uh, brother, I, I, I just want to say... Uh, well, you uh, remember now, I'm not you. optimistic. I'm a prisoner of hope, but no optimism. That's fair. Um, yeah, the that's, politics that's of the hope virtue. without optimism. That's the Christian virtue, not optimism, but hope. Nussbaum, Nussbaum actually wrote a book on that, I think, in the Monarchy of Fear recently, two years ago, and, and she talked yeah. about that as well. It's very interesting stuff on that front. Well, uh, can I just say, you know, Dr. West, it's been an absolute honor to, to speak with you. And I guess I just want to close off with one final question that our audience is also, I'm sure, dying to know. Um, what are your plans and what can we expect from you coming up? Or, or perhaps just more pithily, what's a piece of advice you'd give to all of us out there who are trying to make sense of the world in theory and activism, and, and in all sorts of methods of change, what's what one piece of advice you want us to bear in mind from you? Well, I mean, I'm just blessed to be a mama's child and daddy's kid, and I am who I am because somebody loved me. And I, uh, I view very much the musicians uh, as the real uh, models, in some ways, the vanguards of the species in terms of them mustering the vision and the courage and the willingness to bear their souls to authorize a different reality in the reality in which we find ourselves. And as a philosopher, I'll try to go to school with the musicians and the poets and the artists uh, and have a good time, the joy. So you have to find joy in your quest for truth and justice. And by joy, I don't mean the superficial pleasures. I'm talking about the enduring joys, though, brother. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, it, it's been a great conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Oh, I have. It's been wonderful. You have been wonderful. I can't wait to get a chance to meet, though, man. Oh, we must absolutely meet. So you're going to get a chance to see Brother, Brother Elijah Devon, the Rhodes Scholar from, uh, <laughs> from Harvard. Right absolutely. Out of, uh, chocolate side of Compton. Well, Compton is all chocolate, but it's Compton, California. He's a brilliant That's Brother wonderful. Rhodes Scholar. We're so proud of him. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to end the broadcast now. And... Uh,